Thank you, Denton, and good afternoon to all of you. I hope you all had a good week. Been a warm one, but it's going to start cooling down as of today, and I think that's what I heard. I think it's supposed to get down into the upper 80s by Sunday or Monday, so it'll be nice. The day at the beach tomorrow at the lake should be a really nice day. It should be in the 80s up at Jenkinson Lake. The water temperature is about 76, 77 degrees, so it should be a beautiful day for everybody and anybody that wants to go in the water and just enjoy the beauty of being out in the open. I want to welcome our guests that we have here with us today. And I'd also like to ask you to keep the Kale family in your prayers. As you know, they've been struggling and having difficulties over the last couple of years with Jacob's situation. Well, on top of all that, uh, apparently they came to two kids, Joseph and Jacqueline, came down with a disease. It's not a disease, it's actually a virus called foot, hand, and mouth virus. It's a, it's a situation where on your feet, your hands, and in your mouth, you get these nasty blisters. Both kids had to be brought home a day early from camp with that, and they come to find out that the father, David, is the one who actually had the issue before the kids even went to camp. They picked it up from him. They came back home. Joseph and Jacqueline started getting better. Then two days ago, Jacqueline started breaking out blisters in her mouth again. So she had asked for an anointing cloth, and now they think Jacob may have been coming down with it because he got a sore throat, and that's a prelude to this disease or this uh, viral infection. So it's a miserable thing to have. It, takes, it just has to run its course. There's not a whole lot they can do for it except take Tylenol or Motrin or something like this just to help kill the pain. But please keep all of them in your, your prayers because they're really struggling with this. They really were hoping to be at church today and then go to the picnic tomorrow, but that's just not going to probably happen. So we're, we're hopeful that uh, they can get all get better. I want to thank everybody for doing the special music today. It was really enjoyable and nice to have. And we may have more of that in our future if certain things go a certain way with a certain guy's life. And I'll, I'll leave it at that for right now, and uh, I'll explain it more to you later as the road comes up and uh, things start working out. Well, I'm sure everyone's looking forward to the picnic at Jenkinson Lake tomorrow. It should be a fun time just being out in God's glorious open. should be a great day for it, too. Let's turn to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3 to begin with, 2 Timothy 3. These last couple of weeks have been tough ones to deal with when we see all the chaos that the world is now involved in. We've had it here in this country, down in Dallas, uh, where we had those police officers killed, many people injured. Then there was the tragedy in Nice this last week in France. And then the coup attempt in Turkey over the last couple of days where hundreds of people were killed and thousands of people were injured. This is just hundreds of innocent people being killed, slaughtered, injured, and why? The scariest part about this last couple of weeks is none of these situations are related to each other. They're all independent of each other, all for different reasons, all for different anxieties and traumas. But all the killing and maiming of innocents still took place in all three situations. When we look at and begin to understand the plan of God, there are several points that are worth scrutinizing about it. Because it's the only salvation that mankind has. It's the only hope that mankind has for this kind of craziness and nonsense that's going on in the world to cease. And we have come to learn that the holy days are essentially God's plan outlined for us in a holy day program. They direct us to these key points. They guide and direct us in every aspect of our lives. Would you turn the fan off up there, please, guys? Uh, they outline this plan, they direct us to us, and there's key elements that come about as a result of all this to come, up, come to our understanding. And hopefully, when we come to understand some of these key issues and key points, it helps us in our personal lives as we walk our walk trying to serve God. Here in 2 Timothy 3, Paul addresses this whole concept of God's plan unfolding for mankind. He points out something that is necessary for us to be aware of in, in the future. Something's going to take place in the future that all of us are going to be affected by. I think we'd all agree, agree that we're closer this week than we were last week, closer this month than we were last month, closer this year than we were last year to the return of Jesus Christ. Every day, day that goes by, we're that day, one day closer to that return. And we know because we've studied prophecy, we've studied what's going to take place, Things on this earth are going to get pretty ugly before he returns. It's not going to be a pretty picture. 
It's bad now, it's going to get a lot worse. And it's going to be a lot worse all across the planet. Let's see how Paul addresses this period of time that is approaching here in 2 Timothy 3. And let's begin in verse 1. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. Paul says to Timothy, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And then he says, and from such people, turn away. This sort of thing is in addition to all the brutal evil I was discussing just a few minutes ago. It's just going to get worse. Every aspect of human beings, human relationships is going to deteriorate. And as Paul put it, this is indicative of, as he placed it, in the last days. Okay, I'm going to flip over a couple pages back to 1 Timothy 4, maybe one or two or three pages in your Bible. 1 Timothy 4. I'll be going back to 2 Timothy 3 in a little bit, but let's go to 1 Timothy 4 again, and we'll see here that Paul addresses a similar topic in 1 Timothy 4 that he addressed in 2 Timothy 3. Keep in in mind that Paul is instructing Timothy, his protege, how to be a good minister, how to be a good leader, how to be an individual that's properly interacting with God's people. Keep in mind the recent sermon that we had about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit's active in our lives, each and every one of us. Let's begin here in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1 again. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit that we were talking about last Sabbath, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So we see Paul here is referring to those who were once in the faith. He's not talking about strangers. He's not talking about people just walking to and fro on the face of the earth. He's talking about individuals who are actually members of the family of God, members of the church of God, church of Christ, the the church that Jesus Christ started. And then he goes on in verse 2, he said, And they begin speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So we see here in First and Second Timothy, we have seen Paul discussing two periods of time in, his, in history, historically, prophetically, I should say. And it's something that he was telling Timothy, Timothy needed to pay attention to. If Timothy needed to pay attention to it, we really need to pay attention to it. Because we're 2,000 years closer to this than Timothy was. He also gave him, Timothy, the indicators to look for and to be aware of as these things start to transpire in life. Here in 1 Timothy 4, we just read in verse 1 the expression, in latter times. And if you will recall, in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1, we saw a similar term. It said, in the last days. Let's go to Isaiah 2 now. Isaiah chapter 2, back in the Old Testament. Isaiah 2. Here in Isaiah 2, we'll see yet another term that is linked to the first two that we just read about in 1 and 2 Timothy. So far we have in latter times and in the last days. God had sprinkled throughout the entirety of the Bible, as we're going to see today, several expressions which are signs and signals for a period of time coming. How soon it's coming, nobody really knows. That's why he gave us so many signs to be aware of. Just as we reviewed the many characteristics of the Holy Spirit last week in the sermon, we're going to do a similar thing for this thing today about latter times, latter days, 
in the last days, these terms that we're hearing that Paul has used, and we're going to see they're being used elsewhere in the Bible as well. The statement that we are about to read in Isaiah 2 is repeated almost verbatim in another Old Testament passage of Scripture. We'll read that one too before we end today. This passage in Isaiah 2 precedes that well-known passage that we hear many times almost every single year at the Feast of Tabernacles, where Isaiah was talking about it later in chapter where they were beating their swords into plowshares and their pruning hooks and their spears into pruning hooks. Very well-known passage of Scripture. We know that this is talking about the time after Jesus Christ returns to this earth and the millennial period is set up, which highlights and points us in the direction, if you stop and think about it, toward our next holy day, the Feast of Trumpets, which is coming up soon. Okay, let's take a peek at Isaiah 2. We're also going to begin here in verse 1, Isaiah 2 and verse 1. The word of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This is talking about a time still in the future where God is going to establish Jesus Christ as the leader, the king of kings. And it's all prophetic that he's talking about here in Isaiah 2. Then the passage that I was referring to a little bit ago, verse 4. He shall judge between nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. I'll bet the people in Turkey would love to have that happen. There are a lot of people burying a lot of family and friends over these last couple of weeks. And it's really tragic and really sad to see this happen. And it's not just adults, it's kids too. Down in Nice, France, families are down there vacationing on one of the most beautiful places on the planet. And what happens to them? They get murdered. Half the family's gone, half the family's still alive. They would love for this passage of Scripture to come to pass. So here we are introduced to yet another similar term. This one here is in latter days, in the latter days. Let's flip over to Micah. Micah, just after Jonah. Micah 4. So far, in these terms and expressions that we're discussing, we have in the latter days... We have in latter times, and we have in the last days. Three different expressions referring to similar periods of time. Here in Micah 4, we'll see a very similar passage to what we just read in Isaiah chapter 2. It's one of the minor prophets that we don't turn to very often, but you will definitely probably turn there during the Feast of Tabernacles this year. We tend to go to these passages because they're very millennial in nature during the Feast of Tabernacles, since they deal with so much of this time frame of the millennial period after Jesus Christ returns. All right, let's pick it up here in Micah 4 and begin again in verse 1. Micah 4. Notice how similar this is to what we just read in Isaiah 2. Micah 4, verse 1. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days, same expression, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow to it. Talking about Christ establishing his authority. And people actually coming to listen to him from all across the planet. Many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth, shall the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the people walk, each in the name of his God. But we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Micah's talking about a period of time where this earth is going to be fixed. 
the chaos and confusion is going to be eradicated. The wars, the killings, the maimings, the brutality, man against man, is going to end. But you notice it's all culminating in these latter times. Then as we continue in Micah 4, we'll see yet another term that plays into this theme that we're worth going on today here in Micah 6. Micah 6, 4 and verse 6. In that day, now he's talking about some specific day. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame. I will gather together the outcast and those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forever. God is saying he's going to fix what he broke. His wrath is going to come upon, come upon mankind. God's wrath, when it's unleashed on this earth, is going to kill a lot of people. It's going to injure a lot of people. Mankind is going to be punished for not following God's way of life. Mankind is going to be punished actually in a way that will save them. Because we can read in Matthew 24 that if God doesn't intervene the way he's going to intervene, mankind would destroy everybody on the planet. That is a possibility if God does not intervene. And God says, I'm not going to allow that happen. So these latter times, these latter days, the last day, the last days. We have all of these different terms that God has used to describe a period of time that is yet coming for all of mankind. How about one more? Let's go back to the New Testament this time. Let's go back to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And it's interesting, as I was listening and watching all this stuff take place over the last couple of weeks... Every event has its own form of shock. And its own form of just making you sick to your stomach. I mean, if you stop and think about it, if you listen to what is actually happening, I mean, Jesus Christ told us, watch. Watch and pray. Because there's going to be signs of things beginning to take place, signs happening more and more frequently. I just heard on a newscast this last week, I was listening to one of the nationally syndicated newscasts, I can't even remember who it was I was listening to. And they were talking and they were saying, you know what, when we're watching things happen the way they're happening now, it's almost like terrorism's taking control of the earth. And we are not fixing it. We are not addressing it. This is a commentator, this is an international commentator talking about the fact that Terrorism's out of control. It's popping up all over the place. It's happening in every major part of the world. And it's going to get worse. And that's why God said he wants us to be aware of these things. Why does he want us to be aware of these things? For our sake. Because if we're aware of this, we're going to want to get closer to God and Jesus Christ. That is going to be our only hope. Having our own guns is not going to save us. Having our own supply of food is not going to save us. Having our own supply of water is not going to save us. It's going to be by God's direct intervention that we are going to be saved, protected, and provided for. God wants us to know that. God wants us to understand that. But God wants us also to understand you've got to prepare yourself. Prepare yourself emotionally, physically, spiritually, in every other way. This is one of the reasons why I started the health and fitness campaign seven months ago. As I suggested to both congregations and hundreds of people across the country, we need to get more fit. We need to get healthier. We need to get stronger. We need to become more vibrant, more alert, more energetic, more enthusiastic about living and life and God's way of life. And brethren, you can't do that when you're bogged down with stuff. And all of us are bogged down with stuff. And I'm telling you again and again, and if I'm harping on it, then so be it. To the degree that you try to do those health and fitness program things or something really similar to that, you're going to get a benefit from it. I'm getting feedback from all people all across the country about new vibrancy, new life, no pain, new strength, new energy, clarity of thinking. Enthusiasm, better sleeping, more energy. It happens. But you know, it doesn't happen by osmosis. It doesn't happen with a wand. 
It doesn't happen by eating another Twinkie. <laughs> it happens by not eating another Twinkie. You know, once we start doing it, I'm telling you, I, I know how hard it is. I mean, two years ago, I weighed 195 pounds. And I saw a picture of myself recently, and I about fell over. I was a fatty. And I felt like it. I didn't have energy. I couldn't sleep. I had aches and pains here, there, and everywhere. I'm down to 168 and a half pounds. It's the same weight I weighed when I got married. And you know what? When I first started doing all this and trying to cut certain foods out and trying to add certain foods in and trying to cut back on sugars and cut back, it was hard. I didn't enjoy it, but I knew it was good for me, so I forced myself to do it. And you know what now? This absolutely has happened. I crave the good stuff. I literally crave it. I mean, I can't wait for a lunch that consists of sliced up organic cucumbers, sliced up organic radishes, sliced up organic celery, sliced up organic green pepper, sliced up organic carrots, sliced up any kind of vegetable I can possibly think of, and I fill a platter full of it. And I eat until I am stuffed. And most of the time, it's the entire platter. And I feel great. And I don't crave the bad stuff as much as I used to. In the evenings when I used to always want a snack, it was always potato chips, popcorn, cheese, all the salty, fatty stuff. Now I want raw nuts, a piece of fruit. That's what I crave. I'm telling you, we, as God's people, we need to be more cognizant of our bodies and our minds and our hearts and our brains because it's all we have to give to God. And sometimes we squander it away because of the way we live. So here we're back with John. Jesus Christ came to his disciples. He was out. They were on in a boat three or four miles out on this lake. And Jesus Christ wanted to get to him. So what does he do? He walks across the water. It freaked him out. I mean, they were literally freaked out. And they, was like, they thought they were watching a ghost. He finally got them to calm down. This was an unnerving experience. And then some other dialogue took place. And Jesus Christ started explaining to them that I am the bread of life. And they weren't getting it. It was really perplexing to them. He was trying to get them to start believing what he was preaching and what he was teaching them because he knew that it was beneficial for them to get it. Did they want to learn this stuff? Not really. He called them to it. God called them to it. And he started working with them. And some of the times they, got fought, he, they fought back with him. But you know, they kept doing it. They kept doing it. And they kept doing it. And sooner or later, it started to make more sense. And then finally, when the Holy Spirit came, voila, all of a sudden, the lights went off. That's what happens to your body. All of a sudden, there's this voila, and your body's going, wow, man, I haven't had this kind of energy in forever. And everything starts working better. So he's talking to them now, and the statement that we're going to read in John 6 here is repeated four times in the same chapter. Each time with a little different context, amplifying its meaning. Let's pick it, up, pick it up here in John 6 and verse 38. John 6, verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And how many of us live our lives like that? Not to do our own will, but to do the, to do the will of God and Jesus Christ who called you and called me. Is that our priority, or is it still our will? Then we see the other statement that I was mentioning in verse 39. He says, This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Raise it up at the last day. So one aspect of the will of the Father was that all that Jesus Christ had been given would be raised up, resurrected on the last day when he returns. Again, pointing us to the Feast of Trumpets. Then there's a little twist in this next verse, verse 40. And he goes on, he said, And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last day. Christ is trying to show them 
that all whom the Father has called, all through history, and then heeded that calling. And how did they heed that calling? Going to church every week. Wrong. That's part of it. God absolutely wants us to congregate together for the benefit of each other. It's how we live the other six days. That is the most crucial aspect of being called by God. Everybody can come and put on their church face for two or three hours. And I'm guessing that most of us do, to varying degrees. It's how we act the other six days and 20 hours that really matters. And that's what Jesus Christ is getting them to see and understand. God wants to resurrect every single person whom he's called. Christ is trying to teach them that. Follow Christ's lead. Believe in him. Gain eternal life. He then ties these two concepts together in verse 44. Let's drop down to John 6, verse 44. He said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It's all tied together. God calls, Jesus Christ works with and develops, and then Jesus Christ is going to be the one resurrecting them when they finally make it to the end. Then in reference to the whole Passover concept and the ceremony, which he will introduce to them later on, not here in John, we see this phrase again in verse 54. Drop down to verse 53 to start with. John 6, verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. This is a dramatic statement that is repeated four times here in John 6. I will raise him up on the last day. Four times in one chapter of the Bible. At the last day, he, Jesus Christ, is going to be raising up and resurrecting a lot of people. Hundreds, thousands. We don't even know how many it's going to be, but it's going to be a lot. Turn over to Romans 8. Romans 8. <clears throat> we had so much enjoyment with Romans 8 last week. Let's go there again this week. Romans chapter 8. Remember last week in the sermon, I mentioned that you could subtitle Romans 8, <clears throat> Living in the Spirit. We'll see exactly how that concept would fit in with this one verse that we're going to read here again today. Because it fits beautifully in what we just read in John chapter 6. And for emphasis, I'm going to read this one verse in Romans 8 out of the New Living Translation. Romans 8, verse 11. Romans 8, 11. The Spirit of God, which raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. <clears throat> And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Absolutely confirming what Jesus Christ told us four times in John 6. Relating us back to the day of Pentecost. With a reminder pointing us to the Feast of Trumpets. It's so interesting when you watch God's word blend everything together and make it all fit. Okay, we need to add another phrase to our list today. We have now, at the last day, in that day, in the latter days, in latter times, and in the last days. So what's my point? Think about it a bit. What do all these phrases have in common? Something big is going to happen in the future. Something really big. Turn now to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. As we heard from Paul, <clears throat> as we approach these latter days and latter times, that perilous times would arise. That's not a very reassuring thing to think about, but it is going to, in fact, happen. 
There would be many challenges <clears throat> that we may not even be facing today, at least not in the same degree. But we're going to have to face them. He gave us a list of bad. He gave us a list of ugly and absolutely wrong behavior that would start becoming more and more prevalent <clears throat> here on this earth. He also warned to stay away from people like that when you see it begin to develop. He also said that some people would start getting really wacky with the truth. Just nutso. Start believing weird doctrines. Even demonic stuff. And remember, he was warning against that to people who were in the church. People who knew God's way of life. We also saw in the latter days that some really exciting things are going to begin to happen. As Jesus Christ establishes his reign here on this earth when he returns. No more guns. No more spears. No more swords. Nothing that will take a human life. Or as far as that goes, any life. This would be true gun control, God's form of gun control, and put an end to all of the evil on the earth. We saw that Jesus Christ would start the healing process for those who were lame and outcasts and afflicted through all this stuff at the end of the age. Restoration of humanity and nations would begin to take place. There's a lot of good stuff going to happen but we got to get through the bad stuff first. And as we just read, there would be some resurrecting taking place. <laughs> Lots of resurrecting taking place. Everybody whom the Father called and Jesus Christ nurtured all through history. Every one, every one of them is going to pop up or pop out if you're alive when he gets here. And those resurrections would be done by the same power, the Holy Spirit, that also resurrected Jesus Christ from the tomb. In the exact same way. So we get ready to close. Let's remember that Paul here in 1 Corinthians 10 was addressing all that had happened with our forefathers of ancient Israel and the litany of examples in the Old Testament that were made available to all of us. And when we understand it, it all relates back to us today, those, those at the last day, those in that day, those in the latter days, those in the latter times, those in the last days. It relates to all those people. And every single human being sitting in this room today, it applies to each and every one of us. Let's just read one verse here in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. It's for us. God wants us to understand it. Jesus Christ wants us to understand it. Paul wanted us to understand it. Isaiah wanted us to understand it. Micah wanted us to understand it. One last scripture. Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> Prophecy is in the Bible for a reason. It is there to teach us, those of us who are closest to the end of the age, so we can be prepared for what lies ahead. There is some bad. Yes. There's no denying that. Christ actually told us, pray that you be found worthy to escape that. I mean, there's an escape route. <laughs> there's an escape hatch. There's an escape clause. And Christ said, pray that, you, that the escape clause applies to you. And I've men, mentioned this many of that. That's one prayer I pray more than any other for me and my family. I pray that we are allowed that way of escape. But you know, there's a lot of good stuff coming up too. And Paul told us that it's greater, better, and more exciting than anything we have ever experienced in our life and we could ever begin to imagine. Something we ref, definitely want to be a part of. Christ himself here in Matthew 24 made a comment that is very appropriate to end this sermon with today. He was responding to questions about the times, the latter days, the last days, if you will. 
Just one verse, Matthew 24, verse 13. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Great words to end with, great words to live by. Have a great Sabbath.